You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. So we're going to do a uh, quick, quick turn and try and try and keep this on uh, track as much as we can. Um, so don't, don't short our other uh, speakers and, and let everybody uh, avail themselves of as much content as uh, possible. So if I could, uh, to John Smolin, why don't you come on up with your next group and um, we're going to bring on the market makers of today. Uh, what, what you may think of is uh, the, the current liquidity providers. We'll get them up here as, uh, as soon as we can. John? Thank you so much for the Good morning, everyone. Um, we have four fine representatives from various market making firms here that trade and approach the market uh, a little differently than uh, other firms. So they're all kind of have independent strategies. Their bios are in the materials that you received when you checked in. But uh, I'm going to turn it over to them and let them tell, them, tell you about themselves for a short period. <coughs> Yeah, so my name is Ed Haravan. I'm a partner and COO at Spot Trading. We're a market making firm in Chicago, about 135 people. Uh, very integrated trading operation, combining development of our own technology, uh, research, both, both uh, quantitative and qualitative, uh, trading talent, all combining together to uh, make markets and provide liquidity over uh, the entire listed option space. I'm Pat Hickey. I'm with Optiver US in Chicago. Optiver is a global pri proprietary market making firm focusing on options. Uh, we're, we're liquidity providers in the, in, in the options markets and mainly takers in the, in the underlying uh, security and futures markets. At Optiver, I'm the, I'm the head of market structure, which uh, I, I'm responsible for all the uh, interactions that we have with exchanges, with vendors, with uh, industry, industry groups like the OIC, and help to interface with those, uh, th those participants, uh, bring them inside to Optiver to uh, work with our, our trading, IT, and, and, and other departments. I'm Dan Perper. I'm a partner at Peak Six, and I manage the <coughs> market making and prop side of our business. Uh, we trade in every listed equity out there. Uh, we have our, all of our own technology, similar to, to uh, what Ed said, and uh, we train all of our own people to use our technology and provide markets in across the entire range of uh, equities. Hi, I'm John Schlossberg. I'm a CIO of Equitech Group, which is a holding corporation, a number of subsidiaries, um, many of which are market makers and liquidity providers, uh, similar to these guys, there's a lot of homegrown technology that supports it. And we trade in futures, equities, options, future options, equity options. Basically, if it's a listed market, we're interested, and most times we participate. Fantastic. I'm going to read you guys something here, and I'd like you guys to kind of start the conversation. Uh, High-frequency trading is a type of algorithmic trading, specifically the use of sophisticated technology tools and computer algorithms to rapidly trade securities. HFT uses proprietary trading strategies carried out by computers to move in and out of positions in seconds or fractions of a second. Do your firms do this? <laughs> and if not, let's, let's talk about the difference between this definition of what an HFT firm is and how you guys approach the world, because obviously you're, you're, you're significantly technology driven. So John, I think, I think that definition came from Wikipedia. Yes. <laughs> right. So, uh, one, one thing I learned about the, uh, through the whole HFT debate is, is, is how you get content on Wikipedia and what you need to do and who you need to talk to to make it, uh, make it appear on the screen when you, when you uh, do the keyword search. Uh, the, uh, Optiver is a part of a, a, a group on the future side called the, the Principal Traders Group. And uh, we work very closely with uh, uh, the, the, the CFTC in their uh, technology advisory committee to come up with their own, with the CFTC's own definition of what high frequency trading was. And through the groups, 
uh, um, extensive work on trying to just put a definition on it, uh, they had a much broader definition, I think, of, of what constituted HFT. So uh, I, can't, I, I can't recite it for you here, unfortunately, <laughs> but uh, I'm not going to try that. But, but as for, as for Optiver and how, how we involve, involve ourselves in, 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 in either high frequency or, or low latency or, or high automation uh, techniques, uh, it's, it's, it's imperative for a liquidity provider like us to have the, the access to, uh, to being able to move our quote as fast as we possibly can to reflect the correct price where we want, the, where we want to be displayed and not be subject to somebody else with just as fast technology taking out that quote where we had no intention of trading it in the first place. So, we utilize, if you want to call that HFT, we do utilize that. And we think it's a very good tool uh, because it, it, it assists us in, in creating that spread that's as tight as we can possibly make it and having confidence that that's our, that's our correct price. The, the alternative is to, when you start talking about um, limits on, on, that, uh, on that speed or latency, is that we have to compensate for that in terms of a higher cost on us in, in the form of a wider spread. And it's, we Great. really look at it that simply. John? Um, well, I, I, I actually have some, uh, I have my own desk that I trade, and I guess in that capacity, I am somewhat of a high frequency guy. Um, as a market maker, well, maybe I'm playing semantics, but I don't think market making itself would fit into high frequency, at least the way I define it. I don't think it's possible to trade in the derivatives market with strikes all over the place and not move my markets all the time. Uh, although as a market maker, I'm not getting directly out of the same position I'm in. I am, however, often laying off that risk, at least in delta terms, immediately. Uh, is it a concern for our business? The concern for my business is that it's misunderstood by the people who are regulating it. And, you know, we're, we look at groups perpetually. We're looking at a group presently. And I have outside um, counsel debating whether or not a listed equity option market maker is a high frequency firm, because we really don't want that exposure. Uh, to the extent that I do high frequency on my own desk, I'm a liquidity provider. I learned how to trade as a specialist at Bank of America upstairs. Um, you know, we, we, we built out the market making system for a bank specialist in 2005. That's how I, I know how to provide liquidity. But you know, it's a concern for us. Um, my concern is that people misconstrue option market making as high frequency, which I think would be a terrible disservice to, uh, to a market that I think is. Great. Dan? Um, yeah, I, I, I want to take it in a little bit different direction. Um, I think that HFT is, it was said yesterday that it's impossible to define. And I, I actually, I think that definition is not really what any of us in the industry think of as HFT, but I think that that might be what the public perception is. That's why it's on Wikipedia, I guess. Um, but I think that the, the right definition of what the public thinks they're talking about is uh, firms that are trying to win on speed only. And I don't fault them for doing that. I think that the incentive in the marketplace is there to do it, and that's more where the problem lies. I think that the, uh, I want to keep it brief, but I think that the, the biggest disconnect is there's a lot of talk between about what's best for the customer. I think everyone can sort of agree that what, that, that the customers drive the business and drive the size of the pie and we're all, you know, sort of fighting for a piece of the pie. And the thing that there's no connection made, in my opinion, is where, why does faster and faster and faster speeds uh, help the industry and help the customer? I think that to some extent it was great. I mean, before people were calling on phones, that's obviously awful. Uh, but now you can send a quote coast to coast 30 times in the time that a human can blink an eye. And I don't understand, you know, it was said yesterday that customers are at mouse click speed, and I totally agree with that. Um, in our case, we spend money, resources to, uh, we know we don't have the pockets to be the fastest. We're not trying to be the fastest. We're trying to not get crushed by the fastest. And that's expensive to do that. So we're not trying to win on speed. We're trying to not lose on speed. 
And I think that a lot of the market makers probably are doing the same thing. And ultimately, as there's more exchanges and <clears throat> more of everything and faster speeds, um, that just increases the complexity, the cost, the risk, um, and it makes it really hard to, to manage at a, at a high level. And I just wanted to quote, you know, talk about something that Sully said yesterday in his talk, and he, he said there's 28,000 flights a day, and um, what if there were 28 million flights a day? I mean, th they've solved this problem because there's some limitation to how many flights a day there actually are. Well, we have 28 million flights a day, and solving, they solve the problem by, I mean, obviously it's a different industry and there's customer demand and there wouldn't be 20 million flights a day. But the point is that in, in our industry, if we could cut, if we could limit it to where there are only 28,000, you know, the equivalent of what that would be, then I think that it makes the problem that we're trying to solve a much easier problem as opposed to just letting it, letting it go as fast as possible in as many exchanges as possible and then try to say, oh, well, now that we have all this speed in these exchanges, how do we make sure that nobody gets hurt? And the problem is that humans are still involved. And when there's an issue, especially humans are involved. And the, the, the difference between how fast quotes can be transmitted and how long it takes for humans to make decisions when there's an issue is, is massive, obviously. Staying on that, uh, that subject there about the, uh, the burden that, that the market makers are facing, market maker firms seem to be disappearing at a fairly rapid rate. Uh, leaving the BD behind and becoming customer. Um, Ed, has the regulatory burden and the technology burden become too much? And, and is it, is, are people just kind of taking a, a, a lighter path out? It definitely has created uh, huge barriers of entry to keep uh, new firms from popping up. Uh, there definitely hasn't been uh, you know, the, the natural progression of firms splintering or traders breaking off and starting new firms because of regulatory burden, because of the technology burden, um, you know, with the fragmented market with 13 different exchanges, there's, um, you know, a, a big market access problem that needs to be solved for anyone who wants to achieve any sort of scale in the business. So um, you just don't find that anymore. And increasingly, it's the entrenched players, uh, pricing structures within the industry serve to reinforce that entrenchment um, and inevitably as you creep up it used to be you know, when you migrated from the floors uh, you know 15 years ago um, you know it was the small market maker it was the the one guy the sole prop guy and those kind of just kind of eroded away as scale became more important and costs grow up um, obviously you know that story has been told but you're seeing it again at the firm perspective um, you know there's there's no middle sized firm you either need big, uh, big scale uh, uh, or you need to be incredibly small and, and uniquely specified. And if you hang out in the middle and you're not, you know, all these other forces at play, um, you know, compliance, <laughs> regulatory, um, just make it economically uh, unfeasible to continue the business. So I do think we'll continue to see that. But on the, on the other side of that, though, you know, shouldn't I feel great about the fact that I have you know, the Goldmans and the, the Wolverines and the Citadels who are out there each and every day. What's the risk with them? What happens if one of them leaves and there's this gap in the middle? Is there, is there unforeseen consequences that we need to deal with? The, oh, uh, first off, uh, the original question was about market makers leaving the space. So I, I guess I'd start off by saying I'm not sure I would be a relevant participant of this panel next year um, because Candidly, I'm not sure why I want to be a market maker. I'm, I'm sure we'll touch probably on some of these reasons, but you know, you, yeah, yes, there's absolutely a risk that you have four or five people and one person leaves and it, it just has you know, too, too large of an impact. Um, I think you also end up with other problems, especially when you add some of the other features about the way stuff trades based on payment for order flow away from the exchange. You know, so the, the way these bigger firms are able to facilitate that model in of itself, some little features change, that model falls apart. But right now as a market maker who represents that, that mid-level guy who, yeah, if you give me a small spot, I can pick and choose where I want to trade. But if I'm the middle guy, it's difficult. I have fragmentation that causes massive problems where, again, I think we'll get into that. I had, I used to, you know, 10 years ago, preferential capital treatment was probably justification alone. That if you could run that middle scale, it was worthwhile to be a market maker. 
but for a variety of reasons as a market maker, I don't participate when I think I should, and I participate when I'm getting run over. So what that preferential capital treatment translates to is I can put on a bigger portfolio of bad inventory. It's not really a position I want to be in. And I think as a firm where I don't have to have the obligation exposure, I'm actually subject probably to less regulatory fines, uh, you know, it, it makes more sense. I, I'm, I'd actually like someone to convince me why I want to be a market maker, and I, I'm in the process of getting out of a lot of them. Well, I'm sure Tuman will let you know as soon as it goes south. <laughs> yes. um, Pat, you know, you guys handle a lot of trading, technology, people. You also spend a lot of time on your uh, regulatory stuff. Um, how, how does your regular hand? How, how do you feel that your regulator handles? the issues that are important to you, and, and are there ways that could be better? Uh, you, you know, lately with, uh, I don't know if anybody's read any good book, books lately about uh, <laughs> HFT or not, but uh, I had the misfortune of doing just that uh, about a month ago. And, and our experience with, with, the, with the fallout from that has been that, that uh, the, the, the regulators that are directly in charge of us and the, and the oversight that Congress has over the SEC and CFTC on issues that were drawn up in the book is 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 pretty they're, they're pretty thoughtful they're 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 measured they're they're um, they're 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 using data and not emotion to drive the the, the decision making process there uh, there's there's also I'm not exactly sure how to define it yet, but but separate from the sort of day-to-day -day regulation uh, that the SEC and CFTC cover, there's there's this other set of of quasi regulation in the form of attorneys general and 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 uh, and and class action attorneys who who are also weighing in on the debate, and that is that is very much less data data driven and very much more driven on emotion, uh, going as far as as quoting. Uh, quoting direct pages from the book as, as, as support for, for, for their arguments. So, so that's very much a concern, and I think it should be for, for everybody involved in the industry, quite, quite frankly, and, and we'll just have to see how, it, how, how that plays out. But uh, the, the direct kind of traditional regulators that we have, I've, I, I'm actually pretty impressed with how um, with, with, with how they're going about looking at, lo looking at the marketplace and being, being focused on data. I'd add too, John, that with the industry under the scrutiny that is, is, is current in the environment, um, I think there's a great opportunity for market making firms of any size and exchanges to be working more in concert with each other uh, on the regulatory front. Uh, help me help you, if you will. Um, you know, my feeling is that the you know a lot of the data around uh, in, in surveillance, uh, in rules, the, the high degree of t complexity in the marketplace, exchanges possess that data, and so there's a great opportunity uh, to be uh, to be working not only in concert with other exchanges amongst themselves, but with market making firms, um, availing that data to market makers, um, allowing them to uh, you know stop. The, tomorrow's air, so to speak, tomorrow's uh, software release, which we know is, is always going to be present with technology in the marketplace. Um, you know, there's incented, uh, the exchanges are incented to have a strong, vibrant, thriving market-making community, um, and by, by working with, in terms of uh, availing that data, I think that, that that will go to support that. And to the exchange's defense, um, you know, their regulators, the SEC, don't always make that as easy as possible uh, to, to share, to, um, to use some discretion uh, to help firms along the way and be compliant. Uh, in fact, they, they encourage just the opposite of that. Um, so I think somehow that needs to be reconciled in the industry going forward, uh, given the current environment that, that I don't think is going to be going away. Uh, and, and it's a great opportunity, a, a quick win, I think, that, that could make things a lot better. So there's a lot of factors that you guys have to deal with, cost, regulation, exchanges, connectivity. Um, all this stuff is, is extremely important in how you come up with your quote. Uh, recently, we've had uh, the hopefully temporary increased cost coming out of OCC. How do these things affect what you guys put on the screen, these costs that, that wind up on your, on your shoulders? Um, 
Pat, we'll start with you. Yeah, so, so for, for, for us, it's pretty straightforward. We, we have a, uh, we, we generate a, a, a theor theoretical value and, and, and come up with a, with a spread around that theoretical value that, that kind of encap encapsulates all the risks that we take as well as try to cover the costs that we think is, is inherent in that in, internally. Some are easy to define and some are, some are a little bit harder. Uh, regulatory costs, I, I don't think they get built directly into the spread, but they're, a to, uh, they're, they're encapsulating the total cost of doing business. So when you have, uh, I, I think where it pre pre presents a little bit of a conflict for us is when you see in a, when, when you see a line in, an, in, a, in, in a now public exchange uh, earnings report that says uh, we, you know, our revenues were, were lower because of lower volumes offset by higher regulatory income. And, and that's, that, that's, that's a problem for us because as a, we're, we're trying to manage that cost as close to zero as we can. And to, to Ed's point, we don't know if we're working in partnership with trying to get that cost down to zero with the, with the exchanges or not, or if it's literally a, a source of income. So, uh, so, so that's one issue that, that, that's present. The, the more easily de, uh, defined um, costs of, of that spread are, 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 are exchange fees. So. Uh, there, there's a lot of discussion about rebates and and how those are uh, those present a conflict as well. Uh, but for us, not representing any customer flow, it's the, we use the rebate as a tool in conjunction with the with the uh, with the with the exchange operator to at least be able to define the price in the marketplace that a, a that, a, that a potential internalizer will will be compelled to trade at. Uh, whether it's on my price at the exchange that I'm showing that price or at another exchange where they, where they choose to match. If you take away that rebate, the, it's, it, it very simply gets, gets to be a wider price at that exchange for us. And to us, as you introduce those kinds of costs to, to, in, to continually increase that spread, it just makes it more of an incentive to, uh, to, to take the other side of that trade, to internalize it, to figure out how to uh, capture as, as much of that trade as you can, whether it be using tools like fragmentation or, uh, or exchange order types or, um, or any number of ways. Dan, in, in kind of staying with that, there's a lot of classes, a lot of strikes, weeklies um, being added into the market every day. Um, there's a lot of work required to keep these maintained in price in one system. What challenges do you have and, and do you have any observations on, on how that process works? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot. <laughs> there's, there's too much being added these days and I fear that it's only gonna be more. I think the, the difficulty with adding new strikes and new uh, new products is, once you list them, you can't delist them really. I mean, once there's open interest, you have to leave it. Um, and w we see, you know, for example, in the in the Apple mini, you know, fourth week options, the, the open interest isn't even worth, any, like th there's, no, there's no purpose for those to exist currently. And I think that um, part of, and this is actually a great example of sort of what I was saying earlier about the, the customer. The reason why there's no volume in the Apple Minis is because the markets are too wide. And the reason that the markets are too wide is because the cost for a market maker to transact in Minis is not in line with what it is in, in the regular way options. So you'd rather be tighter in an option that has a lower cost per edge that you can pick up uh, then, and so why would anyone actually make a tight market in minis? There's no reason to. And so I think that this is a good example of where, um, also back to the, the OCC fee increase, that I, I'm not sure that the industry thinks enough about what's, gonna, what's happening further down the road. And I think, you know, I, I totally agree that it makes sense for the OCC to have six months worth of operating capital. Um, but at the same time, I'm not sure that the right answer is to increase the, the fee which ultimately flows through to the, to the end customer. There's, let's be clear, if it's passed through to the exchange and then passed through to the market makers, as Pat was saying, very simply, your market is wider, period. And when your market is wider, the customer has a worse experience, and ultimately that means less volume. So it's actually taking money out of the industry uh, because we have all, all these issues that we have to cover with higher regulatory fees. Uh, and so my, my, I don't know the answer. I have some ideas that I don't think we have time for on the panel today, but the, the whole idea is instead of saying, okay, well, our costs are X as an, as an industry, so we'll just charge more, um, make it so that the costs are 
80% of X or 70% of X. And the only way, in my opinion, to do that is to stop every, everyone in the industry spends money and does their own cost-benefit analysis of what makes sense. Uh, and I, I, I wonder what, what work would be actually be done if the industry as a whole did a cost-benefit analysis. There, there's no way that all of these firms independently would be spending all this money and doing all this work uh, and the regulatory as well. John, we spoke uh, in preparing for this about your passion for the, the market turner or the price improver and how that it was a core value at Equitech. Um, what are your thoughts on how, on how that has changed and, and well, ideas it, on you it? You know, it, it gets into risk of saying a little idealistic, I think, as market makers, it is our job to provide liquidity and price improve customers. Um, and I think if you figure out how to make money doing that, you have a sustained business model because you have a value add and it's not some latency ARB or some other way of squeezing something out of it. But you know, if I, if I went back in time and I was looking at a market that was you know, the figure by a quarter and I came in and bid an eighth and the trade went off, it would transact with me if I was the guy who turned the market. And that gave me an incentive as a liquidity provider, it said, you should try to make a tighter market because you will get that fill. And I think that's a feature that the market provided that was, that was intrinsically related to a good experience for a customer. And I think fragmentation has caused a problem. You know, uh, on some of these exchanges, they do have a Turner indication. So if it happens to trade on that venue, but how, is it going to trade on that venue or one of the other 12? You know, there's, there's too many different markets. And I can be in a situation where if I turn price, I will absolutely get the adverse selection if I'm wrong. They will knock me back in line. And I'm fine with that. I accept as a market maker that's part of the business. But if I turn price and everybody joins me and somebody else gets to fill, well, what that's told me is there was no incentive to turn the price in, in the first place. I should have just been a go-along guy like, well, probably 90% of the other ones out there. And that's not good for the customer. And I think that you know, what fragmentation has done is it's created a, an incentive to not tighten the market for a market maker, which is decidedly against what I think in principle we're supposed to do. And uh, you know, I, I'm willing to eat the bad trades, but I got to eat the good trades when I'm doing something to improve the market. Give me an incentive. Make us compete to improve the market. That's how you make the customer have a better experience. I'm uh, kind of flipping back uh, to, to the cost side. Um, in the, the world of business, obviously money talks, and uh, the exchanges have created programs where tremendous advantages are offered to firms that can pay these large upfront fees and deliver buckets of order flow. What are some of the, the uh, uh, proactive, positive uh, things that you do as kind of middle to upper middle uh, tier mar uh, firms that? maybe not having these, these advantages that the big firms have? I think one way that we approach it is, in, you know, to, to John's point, that there surely is a, you know, on the spectrum, there's uh, surely a great debate and room for debate on what the benefits of being a market maker should be, what the proper incentives are, um, and, and, you know, that balance needs to be maintained for the, for the good of the market. Um, we've kind of viewed it more as, uh, we've definitely evolved our risk model over the years. So, um, whereas, um, you know, in the past, if you if you wanted to be rewarded for being a turner, being first at a price, and you knew liquidity was going to trade only on that exchange or in that crowd or or in whatever name you're quoting, and you could get out of it, you could trade against it. Um, you know, we probably what goes into our pricing is more that well, that's probably not going to happen. And so we we've changed our time horizon in terms of how we view risk. We turned uh, you know change some of the systems we use to manage our risk over longer periods of time. Um, that has, in many ways, created edge for us that, um, that, that we feel is, is, is impacting, that allows us to make good markets, but also can be profitable. Um, so we've kind of approached it to say, like, we, we, we don't want to necessarily compete in the same exact business as uh, some of the larger consolidating firms uh, that, that do a very good job and are able to make money uh, because of scale on much thinner spreads and captive order flow. Um, we've taken kind of uh, a, a little longer term view towards the risk, uh, and that comes, you know, we're, 
we've developed some expertise around it, but it comes with more risk and it changes how you want to fund your business and, and, and what businesses you want to be in. So um, it, it's, it's not clear that that's the solution for everybody in the market, but I think the evolutionary pattern is one that you need to keep finding sources of edge, and if the edge is not fully captured in the quote anymore because of current market dynamics, the, the answer is to, to change your view on risk and what you want to warehouse over longer periods of time um, is a way to combat it. But the, on the payment side too, and, and you know we can't compete with the Citadel model, so we don't play that game. Um, we also try to receive a revenue from, there are firms out there that don't really want to participate in all the payment or want to be abstracted from it to a certain extent where we can blend the rate and give them a better rate back. So it, we also try to engage in other businesses that, that capture some execution revenue. But uh, we avoid that game. I mean, it, it just, it's not a game I'm going to win. Yeah, the, the, when, when you, talk, you, you talked about the prepaid fee uh, benefit that, that comes with that to, for, for paying a whole year's worth of, uh, of exchange fees, uh, another, another form is fee tiers, uh, where, where, where lower fees are paid by people who'd bring higher volume to the marketplace. And, and the, the, the economic uh, rationale behind it is completely understandable, but it, at the end of the day, what it ends up doing is it, is it creates a, a, a means to differentiate between uh, between participants and and whether that's and, and as we're as, as a new topic in in the new market structure debate of 2014 is is about fairness in markets uh, it's it's probably up to debate if that's fair or not uh, it certainly creates a, 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 a means of being able to pick winners and losers though you know you both you all talk about risk and there uh, it, it's been around since the introduction of, of you know, the electronic trading in 99 and beyond. But um, a factor that, ex that you, you all mentioned that affects how you stream is the situation that we see several times a year now where it's the lack of clarity on the obvious error rules and how the exchanges, although probably not trying to be difficult about it, uh, cause issues for you. How do you guys, you know, I'd like to hear from each of you, what happens to your quote when, when this stuff happens? Uh, we'll start with uh, Dan. Uh, I mean, in in our case, uh, you know, we, we've we've been around long enough to to know when potentially something weird is happening, and I think that that's a really good point. I think that you know, when a option with thirty dollars of parity trades one dollar, that's clearly not how technology should function, and I think that. Uh, it just is how it is, and I think, again, I think it goes back to the complexity of, of the marketplace today. Um, so for us, we're, you know, at the, at the beginning of it, we might not realize it because you don't know if it's something where you want to be taking advantage of an opportunity and providing liquidity at the same time, or if you're just like, well, we better get out of the way. And, and in our case, uh, we care more than anything else about knowing what our position is, and that to me is the biggest issue. We have kind of what I alluded to earlier, when there's a problem, there has to be humans involved. There, it, you can't, there's no technology available today to immediately let you know if your trade is gonna be busted or adjusted or, or what's gonna happen. It just doesn't, it just doesn't work. <clears throat> and uh, so not knowing your position as a market maker is the worst possible thing that can happen to you because you could be told later, oh yeah, you bought you know, wh whatever X of, of these options and all, across all these series, uh, and that's a that's a massive risk that that I think there needs to be some way uh, to to get rid of that. You know, air, air trade policies I think are moving up the all-time ranks of of uh, topics to talk about at the OIC, right behind Penny Pilot now. So <laughs> it's. Uh, I, I want to say this is the third or fourth year I remember talking about these these air trade policies and it just seems like the same we're, 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 we're getting close to beating a dead horse about that, that they're that they're problematic the way the, that the uh, structure is today the the what we have what we advocate for risk control inside our own firm and, and mitigation of that risk is a, is a huge strategic endeavor for uh, for over the last couple of years and and what we've developed about uh, about air trade, Policies is that is that the industry really has to decide if if they uh, what what the incentive structure is like for around these the uh, around air trades to begin with. Uh, do they believe in when, that that a trade is really a trade, and and if they and and it has to start there. It's a principle that's that's 
uh, you know, that's what, that's what should guide all these other rules that, that uh, have details with them. Uh, knowing that that's, a, that that's kind of a, um, a high level goal for the, for the industry to get to, the, the, the second thing, the second level that, that, that we can take is that um, we, we, we need to ensure that trades that are going to be clearly erroneous never become trades to begin with. Uh, I think it's, it's, it, it should be fairly straightforward to do that, that uh, taking, looking, looking at past data and seeing what, uh, what by and large, what became an error. Uh, is it because of market orders? Is it because it's on the open? Is it because of some kind of uh, um, exchange order type or something like that? It's, it's, it, 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 do, it just doesn't, I, I, I struggle to, to figure out why it hasn't been done like that yet. And then third, and lastly, we talk about the specific policies. When you do have an error, what are you going to do about it? And those are such a mess right now. We, we have a compliance manual at, at, at Optiver, and, and seven pages are devoted to a summary of what the error trade policies are. So depending on where you have the error at, you either have five, 10, 15, or 20 minutes to call the exchange. We have to know which exchange has which time frame. And it's just, it, it's, it's a mess. And you might not know work. if you're busted, if you're adjusted. Again, back to Dan's point, I have no idea what my, my position is. I mean, and absolutely, the exchange is in a position committing the actual match to prevent the match. I, I'd like to see the exchanges candidly participate in trying to preclude it. Now, that, that sounds great. It's a much more difficult problem than that. It's non-trivial. But I would like to try to start looking at solving the problem there. And if it's not going to be done immediately, let's work towards it but at least consistency across the exchanges so I can at least have one set of rules. So you have one of seven pages, uh, you know, that, that would certainly be of value to me. And the exchange is on the right path with the, some of the mandates out of the SEC to, to harmonize these rules. I think we heard yesterday that those are forthcoming soon. So like, those are all great steps to sure. take. So I, I don't want to okay. yeah, yeah. been talking Thanks, for a while. So. The, as we're, we're coming to a close here, um, one last question, then we'll turn and we'll open it up for some questions. Um, you know, looking out, um, you know, you we, you know, a year from now, two years from now, uh, rates start moving. How do you think it's going to affect equity trading? I think it's going to be a great opportunity for market making firms. Personally, I'm no market force forecaster, but um, we've come through a, a period where um, you know correlations in the market have been very high. Um, everything's acted, you know, like the S&P 500. Everything's acted uh, in concert with each other. There's been very little differentiation between asset. Uh, a lot of what you can do to make markets and, and find edge is, is more uh, relative value, and especially in the single stock era, um, in the single stock space. So um, as more people have opinions, as more as rates rise, I think that there's going to be more people that need to hedge. Uh, it's going to create some different um, asset allocation choices for, for people who manage money. Um, and that is going to create, I think, a, a driving undercurrent of, of differentiation in the market that's going to that's going to provide a lot of opportunities, a lot of differences of opinion, um, which uh, is going to drive definitely drive volumes. But that difference of opinion uh, is generally a time when when market maker firms can go out there and provide liquidity and be on two sides of the quote. Um, you know, I think that's an advantageous time that we'd all while not guaranteed to be successful, uh, surely that's a fertile green field that we'd love to be playing on. So it's I view that as positive. It's kind of funny. I never thought I'd be rooting for interest rates to go up. But I guess I'm locked in my home equity loan, and I'm ready to go now. <laughs> but uh, I think there's a risk transfer that happens. With higher interest rates, you, you, you have the asset allocation. And uh, when you transfer risk between assets, that's when market makers get to step in and really provide the value. And that's when we will we'll make money. And, I, I look forward to that and the volume. <laughs> and that's assuming it happens in an orderly fashion. That's so true. not happening in an orderly fashion, you know, it's probably opportunity and risk there as well. Great. Okay, we've got about five minutes left. We open it up for questions. Uh, there are mics around the room. Seems as though we've we all. solved all problems. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, well, one last question for the panel, and then we'll wrap it up is, is one change that you would like to see that could really strengthen your business. Pat, we'll start with you. Wow, one change. I think, you know, I, I think uh, 
it, it, it was it was already set in motion. I think I think regulatory clarity it was it was a real big issue for uh, for I know for our firm and 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 many others. Uh, you know, going back three and four years with uh, you know post financial crisis and Dodd Frank and what is it going to mean? Uh, that that really um, con contributed to, to to our firm's uh, pausing a little bit before before looking at new asset classes, before looking at new products you know, and, and dedicating resources to it. Uh, if, if, we had, if we had that clarity and we're able to get into those, um, uh, the, those, those, those types of um, uh, trades a little earlier, we may have had more expertise coming into today to be able to uh, do something interesting like with cross assets or something like that. So uh, I, I think b before the book, at least, I think we were getting to the to, to closer to the end rather than the beginning, but uh, it's, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see going forward. And Dan, final word, something you'd like to see? Uh, I mean, I think I would just, I, it, it's a long process, but I would like to see the industry start thinking more about and it's not necessarily for our firm, or, but it's for every firm. I think that w we, we all compete with each other, um, but at the same time, we should be thinking about how together we can, we can improve the, 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 pot, the size of the pie uh, instead of having the incentives, because nobody is actually doing anything wrong for themselves. Everyone is, is acting according to the incentives that are in the marketplace today. So I think that some, I, I'm not sure the answer, but there needs to be some consideration for what those incentives should be in terms of the overall industry as opposed to each of the participants individually. Well, fantastic. Well, I'd like to thank you guys. A wonderful observations, insight, and uh, good luck in the coming year. Thank you all. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.